This screencast is going to lead you through some of the basics in Chapter 4, Section 1, um, dealing with samples and surveys. Um, we're going to take a look at the difference between populations and samples, different types of samples that are bad, voluntary response samples and convenience samples are bad, and we're going to take a look at the correct way to select a sample, as well as other types of random samples besides simple random sample. So let's start with population and sample. Uh, population is the entire group that you're interested in, and the sample is just basically a subset of that group. It's a smaller portion of that group. So we collect data from a representative sample and use that to make an inference about the population. For example, um, maybe we want to know um, what percentage of uh, voters are in favor of uh, President Obama, Obama in terms of his approval rating, uh, what percent of the population thinks he's doing a good job. Obviously, I cannot ask that of all U.S. voters, so we would take a sample um, and we want it to be representative, meaning we don't want to select all Democrats, we don't want to select all Republicans, we want it to be uh, representative of all U.S. Uh, voters. And from that sample that we collect, which might be 50 or 100 people, we can um, make a decision about how the population feels about that decision or about that uh, question. So basically when we design a survey uh, we want to make sure we know the population of interest. It might be all registered voters, it might be female voters, um, and we need to say exactly what we want to measure and make sure we come up with questions that will address what we want to measure. Um, the questions need to be properly worded and we're going to talk a little bit about that um, and how questions can be worded poorly and then they won't even get you the information that you're looking for. Um, and then we need to decide how to choose a sample from the population. If we're talking about registered voters, that's pretty easy to have a list of, of registered voters that we can um, choose from. Um, but sometimes we might not have a list of all the individuals in our population and then how do we go about selecting the population? Well, there's some bad ways to, to select a sample from the population. And one of the bad ways to select a sample from the population is to use what's called a convenient sample. Now a convenient sample is selected in such a way that it's convenient to you and the individuals being selected. For example, let's say that you wanted to determine uh, what percentage of people are in favor of the job that President Obama is doing right now. Well, you could go to the promenade shops because you're going to be there anyhow this weekend and you could go to the promenade shops and ask people that you see um, walking around uh, how they feel about President Obama and his current uh, job that he's doing as president. Um, that would be a convenient sample because you happen to be there, the people happen to be there. However, that sample would be a bad sample because it's not representative of all um, people in the United States. Um, it would not represent people living in poorer communities. It would not represent um, possibly different um, political parties. So it would not be a representative sample. It would be a bad sample. And any inference that we make from that sample would not be valid uh, for inferring to um, all U.S. voters or even all people in the Lehigh Valley. So this would produce an unrepresentative sample in this case. Um, and it's going to show bias. In this case, it's going to favor certain opinions because people at the promenade shop probably have similar opinions. Uh, another type of bad sample is voluntary response sample. Um, and this is one where people can decide whether to uh, join or not. Uh, recently, I got an email from Texas Instruments asking me to fill out a survey related to the use of their products, and, and I did. Um, but it, it's a voluntary response sample, um, and I chose whether or not to answer the questions. So why is that bad? Why is a voluntary response sample bad? Um, because people choose to respond, um, and usually that leads to bias because people with strong opinions um, are most likely to respond. I don't really like the TI Inspire, and I wanted to let them know why, so I gave them that opinion. Um, and maybe that's the type of opinion they're looking for, but my opinion is probably not representative of all uh, people who use TI products. So you have to be careful with voluntary response samples. Um, and our textbook actually I think talks about an example of a voluntary response sample 
uh, where Ann Landers asked people if they had a choice, would they choose to have children again? And there was a large percentage that said no, they would not choose to have children again. And those obviously were people that were very unsatisfied um, and wanted to make their opinion known. Um, a different sampling technique um, would produce a very different um, answer. Um, so how do we actually get good samples? And that's to do something called random sampling. Um, and basically it involves chance. Um, basically, let's say I wanted to um, have my population of interest be all Moravian Academy students. Um, and let's say I wanted to ask their opinion about the dress code, for example. Um, obviously I could ask every single student because there's only about 280 upper school students, so I could actually gather that information from everybody, but if I wanted a representative sample, um, I could actually randomly select um, using a calculator or a table of uh, random digits, I could randomly select, um, let's say, 10 people. So how would that work? Well, let's say that there are 280 students in the class, um, or in the upper school, I would number them from 001 using three digits to 280. You might say, well, why do we have to use three digits? Um, and that's because our largest number here, 280 people, that's represented by three digits. We need to represent this by three digits as well when we use our random number table. Um, and so let's say I take a look at digits in groups of three on my random number table, and these are some of the first few digits I have in groups of three. Um, this one I would ignore because I don't have a student labeled number 932, but the seventh student on my list would be selected and the 231st and so on until I've selected the number of students I'm interested in. In, in this case, maybe it's 10. All right, so this is basically describing what I just did. And your textbook goes through another example where you're choosing four hotels from this list of 28 hotels. So they're gonna choose two digits at a time. And the first one's 69, well, there's no hotel labeled with 69, but there is a table labeled with five, or excuse me, a hotel labeled with a five, and a hotel labeled with 16, and none labeled with 48. There is one that is 17, and so on. So basically you're going through and choosing two digits at a time until you've found the number of items you're interested in, in this case four, being randomly selected. But there are other sampling methods. Um, you know, simple random sample is, is pretty straightforward, um, but maybe you're interested in, in making sure you have some from each group. For example, maybe I want to make sure I have freshmen, sophomores, juniors, and seniors, because my simple random sample might pick only seniors in their opinion of the dress code, or maybe it'll only pick freshmen and get their opinion of the dress code, and maybe I want to make sure that I have some people for, that are freshmen, some that are sophomores, some that are juniors, and some that are seniors, that are giving me their opinion about the dress code. Well, the grade, freshman, sophomore, junior, or senior, would be my strata. And if I select randomly select, let's say, five people from each grade, I'd have what would be called a stratified random sample. Um, maybe your strata are uh, Demo Democrats, Republicans, um, and you're looking for an equal number in each um, as you're selecting random uh, as you're selecting registered voters and getting their opinion. So your strata is usually some categorical variable, gender, grade, age, um, that type of thing. All right, so let's take a look at another sampling method. Um, <clears throat> sometimes uh, it's hard to actually get at the entire population. Um, so we select groups of individuals that are near one another, maybe um, you're randomly, uh, you're looking at fish in a pond. Um, well, to randomly select, um, first of all, it'd be hard to number the fish you know, and, and make sure we're randomly selecting a certain fish based on their number. Um, so maybe we'll randomly select a single group of fish. Um, maybe we'll choose five different locations and, and at random from our map and select 20 fish from each of those locations to get a sampling of um, the fish and weigh them all to get an idea of the average weight. So that would be a cluster sample. So we might divide the lake um, into um, groups. So here's our lake. And we would divide it into different regions. Um, let's say there are eight regions here. And I'm going to randomly select 
uh, two numbers between 1 and 8. Maybe I randomly select 1 and uh, 7. And then I would go and randomly select, or not randomly select, to select 20 fish from this group and 20 fish from this group. So I'm using this entire cluster and this entire cluster. Um, so all the fish that I found in this cluster and all the fish I found in this cluster would be chosen. Um, your textbook gives an example uh, that you can look at describing your simple random sampling, stratified random sampling, and cluster sampling. So make sure you look at that example. So the whole reason for sampling is because we can't get at the larger population. So we take a look at a sample and use that to make conclusions about the population. And that's called inference. And most of the second semester focuses on inference. Uh, for example, um, a study on a new cholesterol drug. How does that impact all people with cholesterol? Well, we don't know because we can't give the drug to all people with cholesterol. So we give it to a sample by doing a well-designed experiment. And based on that sample, we can make conclusions about the entire population and how it would affect the entire population. That's inference. Okay. Um, and uh, we know that if we take a sample, that it's probably not exactly what's going to happen in the population. For example, let's say I take a um, sample of uh, 20 Moravian Academy Upper School students and ask them their opinion of the dress code, ask them if, if they think it's reasonable, and let's say that 50% uh, of them think it's reasonable. Well, that 50% might not be true of the entire student population. That might be off by a little bit. And there's actually something called um, sampling variability. A different sample might produce a different percentage. It might produce a 40% approval of the dress code. Or it might produce 55% approval of the dress code. We expect that. That's going to happen from sample to sample. Okay? But because we've randomly selected students, we can be confident about our margin of error, that we're not off by that much. And we're going to talk more about that in future chapters. Um, polls, they usually say, you know, 50%, plus or minus 3%. What is that plus or minus 3% and where does that come from? We're going to learn about that. So what can go wrong with a sample survey? Um, well, there's something called under coverage bias. Um, and there's when a group might be left out. Um, for example, um, in the census, a lot of times homeless people are left out um, because they're hard to find and hard to count. So there could be under coverage. Non-response occurs when an individual refuses to participate or they cannot be contacted. Um, so you want to have a certain person participate. They've been randomly selected, but they're saying, I'm not going to participate. And maybe the people that choose not to participate have a common characteristic. Um, so you have to be careful about non-response. Response bias. Um, uh, incorrect responses. So for example, let's say you ask somebody their um, income and you want them to give an exact value. Well, it's likely they don't know their exact income, so they're going to estimate. Um, and that could be a lot higher or a lot lower than what it really is. Um, or maybe you ask them, you know, um, how many times in the last month did you eat breakfast? Well, that's going to tax their memory, that question, and they're just going to make a guess. Um, it'd be better to ask, how many times have you eaten breakfast in the past three days? They can remember the past three days, so you need to be careful of response bias. And then wording of the questions. Um, wording of the questions, for example, um, are you in favor of um, welfare programs that, that help uh, people to support themselves? Well, who wouldn't be helpful uh, wanting to have people help themselves? So a lot of people would say yes to that question. But what if the question was, are you in favor of welfare programs if it's going to increase the amount of taxes you have to pay? Well, no, of course not. So the wording of a question can influence the answer to a question. So that's something that you have to be careful about as well. All right. Please make sure you now go to do the survey at tinyurl. Um, and we're going to look at, at the statistics for the answers to this in class. Thanks.